First of all, I have to start thanking uh, uh, Pastor Eric for, for his kind help in translation, which is very important. <coughs> After a long day, he is with us, prolonging his, his work. Thank you very much indeed. But the, the, at the same time, I would like to thank you, Roland, for your kind invitation to be an ambassador of the House of One. I take it as an enormous honor, and I would like to be as, of as much help as I can along with my brother Ali Abir, who is a head of Muslim community there in Georgia. He is sending his love and his greetings to you all. He regrets he could not be here, but he, he also committed himself to do his utmost to, to be good at the ambassador of the project all of us are believing in. Perhaps I should, should start by, by saying why I am here and what brings me here. I come from Georgia which is a very small country. Uh, in Soviet time, people would not even know where Georgia is, but after the breakup of the Soviet Union, there are 15 different countries that came into being, Georgia being one of them, very small one, and if I want to show people where Georgia is, and I use a globe or map, and put a finger on it, you can't see anything, it's, it's so, so small. <laughs> <coughs> but Georgia is a country which has been surrounded by larger empires and larger political forces in the course of history. We had to deal with um, Iranian culture, Ottoman culture, Byzantine culture. Then we were surrounded by, by majority Muslim nations and our life was about struggle and survival. And uh, in the 19th century, when Georgia thought that they wanted to have a more peaceful life, our royal family decided to find allies. And in the search of allies, they went to, came to Europe, went to, to Rome, went to France, and then ultimately decided that they would like to find an ally that would be closer to them and would be of the same religion. And they saw that such, a, such an ally would be Russia, that would protect such a tiny country from the larger, larger neighbors. It seemed politically to be very correct to find an ally but, uh, and seek the, the friendship but the main problem was that Georgian understanding of friendship proved to be utterly different from the Russian understanding of friendship. <laughs> For Georgia, friendship was about equal footing, cooperation, genuine interaction. But for Russia, it was annexation of yet another territory. This is how we ended up in the Russian Empire. Our culture was different, our language was different, our traditions were different, but we, we, we found ourselves in the Russian Empire. Then time came when we, we were able to regain independence, and such an opportunity was provided by the Great Revolution in Russia. Georgia became independent again, and for three years it was independent. But sadly, it was reoccupied by the Soviet Union in 1921 because of the political development in, in, uh, in, in Moscow. In Moscow there was a struggle for power among various small groups and one of the groups that was striving for power uh, happened to be Georgian. And unless Georgia was incorporated into the Soviet Union, they would be seen as foreigners. Therefore, they made a solution. They occupied their own country over again. And for another 75 years, we are part of the Soviet Union. Along with the breaking up of the Soviet Union, Georgia regained independence. And since that time, we had to learn how to be a new nation how to be a democratic society, how to build democracy, but obviously we have got a lot of things to learn in the process. Religious in Georgia is, 
is a Christian country, traditional Christian country. It was one of the earliest Christian nations to become, uh, to adopt Christianity as a state religion in the early 4th century. And since that time, Georgia has been a, a uh, culture that was nurtured by Byzantine Christianity, Eastern traditions, and other neighboring, neighboring cultures. When the Soviet Union collapsed and we, we became an independent nation, we needed to have a national narrative. And all nations have to have a national narrative one way or another. Sadly, we did not have a modern national narrative. So we, we discovered, rediscovered the old national narrative, which was uh, medieval. But um, the truth of the matter is that medieval narrative cannot possibly work in the postmodern world. In accordance with the medieval narrative, uh, Georgia is the person who is Georgian by blood, who is a person uh, Christian, who is Orthodox Christian, and, and culturally amalgamated into this uh, the, the nation. But these, these uh, markers do not necessarily match modern markers of nationhood because modern, modern markers of nationhood should be based on citizenship and it should not matter who you are, what sort of blood you have, what sort of uh, religion you, you own and what sort of tradition you have to uphold. Because of this uh, misunderstanding of national narrative we are struggling with, uh, within our country. Therefore, uh, in accordance with this, with this old narrative, there is little or no room for those who are Muslim, who are Christian in different ways. You can be Roman Catholic or Protestant, but if you are not Orthodox, you do not really belong to this national narrative. And therefore, all those who are not Orthodox are somehow sidelined. And another, another dimension that, that, that became a part of the modernity in Georgia was that we have discovered that there is a difference in, in, uh, in our society and there are uh, members of the LGBT community and since the being a member of the LGBT community does not belong to the national narrative, there should not be a place for them either. So these are the dimensions that, that made us to think very carefully what does it mean to be, to be Georgian? Is it about Orthodox religion? Is it about uh, blood, uh, blood relations with, uh, with Georgian culture? Is it about the uh, uh, heterosexuality? The, so these are the challenges we, that we had to, had to respond to in the contemporary time. In this struggle, we found out that even though by the majority of people could be, Muslims could be considered as, a, as an issue, bearing in mind what is happening in the surrounding of us, but truth of the matter is that Muslims can actually be solution of many problems in our country. Problems of nationhood problems of diversity could be solved with help in cooperation with Muslims, both Shias and Sunnis. I, am, I, I understand, I am talking very correctly, politically very correctly what I am saying now, but I should show you the trajectory that brought me here, um, that made me, made me sure that that is the only way to go forward. I need to, to take you a little bit back to history, but not too far. In 1999, in the aftermath of russian Chechnya war, there was an influx of Chechen refugees to Georgia. Georgia is traditionally Christian Orthodox country, and Chechnya is traditionally Muslim, Sunni, Slash, Sufi, Sufi, Sufi nation. But beyond this, beyond Christian Muslim tension in the region, we had some, some memories. 
memories can be sometimes very helpful and sometimes not very helpful. Georgians and Chechens have very good memories. <coughs> Georgia is a small country, but it's located in the valleys. We have got lots of uh, lands that is cultivated, produce lots of crops and um, wine grapes and fruits and vegetables, very fertile. Chechnya, on the other hand, is a very beautiful country. Highlands and mountains, but nothing to cultivate and nothing to, to produce to support a family. So the Chechens have to be creative how to support their families, their economy. The economy they developed over the period of centuries um, was kidnapping. So uh, they would come to Georgia and neighboring nations uh, in the autumn to kidnap young lads and ladies children, uh, take them down to slave markets in the Middle East, Turkey, elsewhere, and uh, that this is just build up their economy to support their families. But you can imagine if you are a Georgian and for centuries you hear, and, and everything that you hear of Chechens is bad, because they are they're taking your people, they're, they are, they're, 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 we have to protect ourselves, Every single village had to be a castle. And if you travel to Georgia, you will see lots of fortifications around eastern Georgian villages. And they had to build houses very close to each other out of fear of um, autumn raids. So when we heard about the Chechen refugees coming to Georgia, um, we were some, some delighted to see them struggling and suffer. It was Advent time. But it, it was in fact in this time, uh, this season, 1999, when a lady came, a writer, came to the church, Peace Cathedral, and told us about the Chechens suffering on the border coming to Georgia. Um, they were children, women without food and without um, the, the, the clothing and medicine. Uh, and I asked, the, the, the lady told us about it, and then I asked congregation, what should we do? And this is the time when Georgia itself is suffering in the, after the, the Soviet the collapse of the Soviet Union. We didn't have much, much food and those things. And I asked the congregation of a few hundred people what we should do for the uh, refugees from Chechnya. And there was a silence in the congregation. Nobody wanted to talk. And I, I knew exactly what the silence meant. Because um, if you hear that your traditional enemies are suffering, somewhere in the, the corner of your heart, you might think that um, that's a matter of justice. <laughs> they get what they deserve. But uh, it was a Advent time, and you could not help thinking of Christmas and Christ, baby, etc. Uh, all the niceties, um, and uh, uh, about the message of Christ, uh, about loving the enemy. We knew that they were enemies, but what our boss said about loving <coughs> enemies. So we said, okay, for once, we go to the camp, take whatever we can. And then forget about them. Well, there are other islands in the church that we would collect whatever we could, and people people were very kind to bring one kilo of potatoes and one preserved jar or jam, etc. So we collected everything, went to the camp, and there were five thousand refugees there. And it was um, it was an incredible encounter. We met our enemies. Blood saves the enemies. For the first time, face to face. And we saw their tears. And we saw their suffering. And we could not help identifying ourselves with them. When we were, we were living in the camp, out of sheer politeness, we said, we always said this, don't we? Um, if there is anything we can do for you, never hesitate to ask. We should not have done it. 
They immediately produced a long list of dog shopping lists. They wanted this and that and medicine and food and tea and the binding material. Um, and then we, so we went back to Tbilisi, uh, the capital where we live. I went to office and it was my first online fundraising effort. I wrote a letter to all my friends asking I need um, some funds, not for, for the congregation, not for Georgians, I need money for my enemies. <laughs> so we see, uh, that was, that was um, Thursday, I go next morning to the office, I open my email account, and I see pledge of 500 US dollars. Then uh, on Monday, we have got 10,000 US dollars. Within a month, we have got 150,000 US dollars. Well, we wanted to help the Muslim refugees, but not that much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, within half a month, we have got this amount of money. That was designated money, you couldn't do anything else with that. But you have got this money, what, what do you do? And I think it was a great challenge for us to imagine ourselves into the shoes of the refugees and think they in a way they would thought about their needs and we found ourselves being involved for the next five years in the relief work. <coughs> and I often say to my people and to my Muslim brothers and sisters and it was an encounter with, with Muslims uh, that made me a Christian, already being a bishop of the church. It was a very deep experience of fellowship, commitment, enrichment, and this, this encounter helped us later on to, to change our attitude, to broaden our, our attitude um, in relations with uh, religious diversity, cultural diversity, and also the challenges that face the church. Later on, we, we, when we face, face rise of Islamophobia in Georgia, our church was prepared. We knew how to handle it, how to build relations with Muslims, and through, through this process of bridge building, how to, to, to make peace and how to foster reconciliation between Christians and Muslims. And something that we found, uh, this is one of the main discoveries, which is very simple, can't be more simple. The only way we found out to, to fight Islamophobia, well, there are several ways, but the most efficient way is, um, is a result of, of our experience. We tried many things, that was teaching, preaching, seminars, encounters, but something that proved to be the most efficient was a very simple experience. In 2013, a group of drunk policemen raided a Muslim village on the Black Sea. They stopped Muslims and and check whether they were wearing crosses on their chest and if they did not and why Muslims would wear crosses they were physically abused later on what was so was the Christians would not let Muslims pray on Friday in their own worship places and that, and that, was, that was obviously very um, upsetting for all of us, we, we felt very strongly that we had to react. The one thing I did personally, and I always believe that however situation is difficult, there is something that can, can be done, I said I took my cross, as a bishop I had to be wearing now a cross. Um, and I took cross off and say that I am not wearing a cross as long as Muslims can be humiliated and, and uh, many women to the Muslim region where people were 
deeply offended and upset about the Christian attitude to Muslims. The group was a little bit scared. They didn't know what to expect from the Muslims, uh, they, they, they or terrorists. Um, and uh, Muslims didn't know what to expect from Christians that, that, that continuously abused their faith and humiliated them. When we arrived to this region, the Muslim host said that we have got a lovely hotel reserved for you. You can stay all night and tomorrow we start the work. Trying to bring Christians and Muslims together. And then we said, can we kindly take these 20 people and send to different Muslim homes so they stay all night there? But they were a little bit reluctant and then they said, okay. Um, we, we went to the, to the, to the uh, mosque and then from there we were distributed to different, 20 people to 20 different families. And what we saw as a result of this encounter was quite remarkable. And I think that was a, perhaps this is, a, this is an answer to many, many uh, issues we are, we are facing now. These people went to Muslim families, they had lunch, they had dinner there, Next morning they had breakfast, and by lunchtime they were friends. Their perception of each other had dramatically changed. They were laughing and making jokes, etc. And, they, they, and, they, and since that time, we see time and again something that help and heal wounds and suspicion, Islamophobia or any kind of phobia, is to help people meet. And when the people meet, that can be the beginning of change, beginning of reconciliation, beginning of building of a better future. And this is why I feel very honored to be here. This is why I feel very honored to be a part of this project of the House of One. Because if something like this what was happening 20 years ago, it would be a sheer luxury to think of building a place where Christians, Muslims and Jews would be, would be coming together. But now it is not luxury any longer. It is a necessity. We need to show the world as people of faith that we can come together. We can love. We can work, we can respect, we can forgive, we can work for, for reconciliation, not only among Muslims, Christians and Jews, but beyond. Because this is a world we are, we are a part of. I'm a great admirer of Jawad and Rumi, who used to say, if you are confused, if you lost your way home, then take the, a horse of love and this horse will take you home. And I think we live in the world which is deeply confused. And the only way home is to take a horse or horses, we are rather numerous. Horses of love and reconciliation to go home. Thank you very much indeed.